In this video, we'll go through calculating the occupancy, the egress requirements, and the plumbing requirements based on our code compliance plan. In the previous video, we started with our area plan, and we have already established that for the sake of this demonstration, the area boundaries and the Revit areas already exist inside this model. Keep in mind that if you're just starting your code compliance plan, you'll need to go to the area plans, create the area boundaries, and place areas uh, for either each room that you have in your model or each area of a specific occupancy type that you would like separated out for calculations. My preference is always to place one area for every room that's in the model. Once you have them all placed, there are a number of different schedules that you can go to work in where you can fill out the different requirements for the workflow to be successful. For simplicity's sake, there are a series of schedules that are all called working uh, that are named in title case at the bottom of the schedules and quantities area. To start, I'm going to go into working life safety occupancy schedule parentheses life safety areas. This is generally the one that I always start in. When it opens, you're going to see the list of the areas that you have in your model along with their area numbers. Keep in mind these are the areas, not the rooms. Because this sample model only has one story, uh, you're only seeing areas from level one. A nice thing about completing this task in the working schedule as opposed to the actual sheet schedules is you can do all of the levels at the same time. First thing that you need to do in this schedule is you need to fill out the area function or the occupant load factor from the IBC code. If you click anywhere that it says none, you'll see that this is actually a dropdown that is populated with the IBC 2012 uh, occupant load factors. So for instance, for this tenant space, I'm going to pick mercantile areas uh, on basement and grade floor areas. You can then copy and paste similar occupant load factors anywhere that you need to use them in the schedule. One particular item of note is that you may have spaces that have fixed seating. Uh, this may be things like movie theaters or auditoriums or other assembly spaces. Um, as the code calls for assemblies with fixed seats to have uh, the occupancy based on the number of fixed seats in the area, uh, you can actually pick assembly fixed seats and then you can type in the number of uh, seats in a later schedule. If you don't have a need to tag the occupancies in your plan, but it's acceptable to simply have the occupancies shown in the schedule, this is as far as you need to go with the first schedule. You'll see that there is a schedule on the sheet now that is showing the occupants calculated, and you can reformat your schedule as required to get it to fit on your drawing properly. There is also a method of taking all of the area tags that are visible in the code compliance plan and switching them for one that actually shows the occupants, such as name, number, area, and occupants. If you wish to take use of this workflow, however, the extra column that was present in the schedule does need to be filled in. You'll see that there is an occupants calculated and an occupants manual parameter. A dynamo graph can be used to do this, or it can be done manually, and you'll notice that there is a check that runs on the cells themselves so that if the values match up, they turn blue. This is an important part of the workflow because we know the calculated occupants are going to change if anything changes the square footage of these areas themselves. So as the project develops, if the wall for 
optimizing these two areas moves a few feet, we know that their square footages will also change and the number of occupants will probably change as well. In the future, that is going to mean that the area boundaries will also need to be aligned with those walls. You may choose to lock or create your area boundaries using the pick wall tool so that things move a little more uh, in sync. Now that we've adjusted those walls and area boundaries, we can go back to the occupancy schedule. And you'll see that some of the cells are no longer blue. That's the indication that the occupancies have changed and the value in the right column is now out of date. This is generally one of the last things I check before printing drawings. For the assembly room or area that has fixed seats, you can then go back to your area plan and select that area. And you'll notice that there is a parameter called assembly fixed seats seat count. Whatever you type in for the seat count there will actually be used. And you'll see here that that auditorium is now calculating the 250 seats based on the number that was typed in. If you still need to tag it, you can type in the same 250 and you'll see that that area now behaves just like the other ones in terms of shading blue. After you're done with the occupancy schedules, directly below it, you'll see two versions of the plumbing schedules. The one called clean simply has a lot of the columns that are needed for the math functions in Revit to be hidden so that you don't need to see them. If you go into the schedule marked clean, you'll see another drop down that says none everywhere that is called the plumbing occupancy key. This is where you'll want to fill in the plumbing occupancy key for this building. Currently, we'll call it B uh, just for the sake of this demonstration. And again, you can copy and paste throughout this schedule. Once you have everything filled in, you'll notice that if you slide to the right, the schedule is starting to calculate how many water closets, how many labs, how many bathing units, and how many drinking fountains are needed for the project. You'll notice that the template keeps all these values unrounded. I recommend leaving them unrounded and then simply providing an additional schedule of plumbing fixtures in your project. If you tell these values to round, they will round at the individual line items, which can greatly exacerbate how inaccurate the totals of the schedules are. For this reason, I keep them all unrounded. Because of how the code is written for business occupancies, uh, if you were to go to the other plumbing fixture schedule, you will simply see that uh, this schedule has a lot of specific math going on where we're basically calculating the occupancy of each classification as a total and then performing the IBC calculations on that and then dividing it back down into where the percentage of occupants go. This is pivotal uh, for getting uh, IBC plumbing requirements to work correctly inside Revit. Uh, therefore, that's all this extra schedule is doing here is exposing all of that math in case you would like to double check it yourself. The last type of schedule for us to tally up is the exiting data. And one of the first things that we're going to do is we're going to go into exiting data settings, which is a very simple schedule. It's basically one line. And this line is simply asking you, is this building sprinklered, yes or no? Keep in mind that in Revit, every checkbox has three options, a yes, a no, and a maybe, which is what you're looking at when you see a gray checkbox. So we will check the box. And we will then say, is there the exiting with 1005 exception being uh, hazardous or institutional occupancies? And we're going to say no, so we're going to pick other. You'll notice that the moment we do that, it starts to give us all of our exit width requirements, which is unsprinklered and sprinklered versions, uh, 0.2 and 0.3 inches. If we then go to our final schedule called exiting data, you'll see that it has calculated based on this make-believe model with 106,000 square feet, we essentially need 490 inches of exiting width. 
you can now compare this to your egress doors and see how you come out. Up until this point, we have basically stayed in the working schedules, uh, and there are a few other working schedules that you should be aware of. The ones marked key are driving the occupancy and plumbing and exiting schedules that we've looked at thus far. The first one, called key area occupant load factors, is what creates the drop-down selector for all of the occupant load factors. You'll see that currently they all say IBC 2012, as that's what's been input in the template. If you need to be using a different code or IBC 2009, for instance, you can actually start inserting rows and then calling them IBC 2009. And now you don't have to wholesale select uh, between one or the other and delete them out of the template. You can simply take the values that are the same and copy and paste them, and you can take the values that are different and you can change them as well. Similarly, there is an exiting occupancy width factor key schedule that is basically inputting the unsprinklered and sprinklered widths uh, based on the hazardous institutional and other occupancies for IBC 2012. If you're using a different code where those values are different, you can either edit the schedule or you can use insert data row to insert more drop-down options. The last one that you may want to edit is a key that says what is the door egress width factor. This is actually a modified door schedule which is interacting with every door that you have in the project. And this schedule is simply saying what is the width per occupant for all of the doors. We currently have it set to 0.2 inches. If you need to change it, you can do so here. Changing this value will probably give you a few pop-ups that says you're editing door types. You'll have to click OK on the way through. Now, while we've been working in these schedules, we have stayed down in the working schedules uh, for the majority of the time so far. There are duplicate schedules that are just formatted a little cleaner that exist on all of the code compliance sheets already. So you'll notice that our exiting requirements for the 490 inches has shown up uh, for level one on our level one code compliance plan. Likewise, our life safety uh, calculations for number of occupants has also showed up on this plan as well. You may want to remove the blue formatting before printing. I like to keep it on on the sheet so that I can see any discrepancies in the areas while I'm doing my page turn through my set of drawings. The last schedule that exists on the code compliance plan is egress travel paths. Travel paths in the parallax template for code compliance are done using the Revit railing tool. If you go to the railing tool, you'll notice that there are several railing types that are called life safety. There is one for common path of travel, there is one for egress paths, and there is one for paths between fire extinguishers. If you wanted to mark that distance on a plan, you could draw the distance between your two fire extinguishers using the FE distance, and you'll see that all three paths are fire extinguisher distances, our egress paths, and our common paths of travel all get different line styles and different colors. You may notice in the parallax template that all of those railing types have also been removed from all of the other views aside from code compliance. They don't show up in plans, they don't show up in 3D views, they don't show up in sections or elevations. In addition, you can use annotate tag by category to place tags on all of the railings. By default, none of the railings are scheduled in the egress paths. If you start tagging them and you give them mark values that start with E, they will then show up in the egress travel path schedule. You'll now see that E2 is included in the schedule Keep in mind this model is make-believe and has not actually been designed to any real code. This is handy if you want to show common path of travel but you don't actually want to schedule these values. Uh, I like to make the common path of travels with a C and I like to tag my distances between fire extinguishers with an F. So we'll simply tag this and we'll call this 
FE1. This is basically uh, the method that we use for tagging travel distances throughout our code compliance plans. Keep in mind that any areas where travel paths run next to or down the same portion of the hallway with each other, they both must be drawn in their entirety, even if you're going to overlap them for graphical simplicity. Uh, if you go to do this, make sure that you still draw this entire sketch line down to the end, as if you end the line at the intersection, you will not have the correct length. I recommend keeping them separate and just having them run parallel down the hallways where possible. This wraps up the different tools that you can use to populate all of the schedules and drawings in your code compliance plan within the parallax template.